Hey guys, how's it going? I want to take you through the complete process of updating a classic late 80s, early 90s bathroom. Now you can see behind me, we got some funky colors going on in here and it needs a little sprucing up, but I want to keep it to the budget and be DIY friendly so you can take on the same project at your own house. We're gonna target a budget of $1,500 in this space. This bathroom should look completely different by the time we're done. So let's jump into it and show you what the bathroom currently looks like and then get into the demo. I will be taking the Vanity Life off the ceiling and putting it on the wall. We'll get a new mirror and this is a 60 inch vanity base. I'm gonna to try to salvage the base, but we will be getting a new vanity top and also faucet. Now we'll be putting a new towel ring, not a robe hook and then a new towel rod, but keeping the toilet paper dispenser that's in the wall. Toilet is in great condition, so we will be removing that, but putting it right back in. Trim is in pretty good condition. I'll be carefully removing that so I can put it in place. And then the floor will be replaced with new vinyl plank. So the one piece surround will be coming out and also the shower doors, even though gold is coming back into style, I wanna get this removed and get access to the plumbing to make sure the mixing valve and all the plumbing lines are good behind the wall and also move the shower head higher because right now it's pretty darn low and this is gonna be an Airbnb and rental. So I wanna make sure we have low maintenance for years to come. And the last thing is that light will be replaced and actually installing an exhaust vent and light because again, I want to make sure I can exhaust the air out of the bathroom to reduce future mold issues. First thing in the demo, I'm actually gonna remove the door by tapping out the hinge pins with some old side cutters and a hammer. Here I just have two hinge pins, you might have three. Then I'll just open the door, take it right off the hinges, and then take the door out of the bathroom so we just have more space to work. Knowing that I'll be putting in new vinyl plank, I want to remove this trim, but I do want to reuse it. So I'll take my time, I'll score the top of it so I can remove it in one piece and not damage the drywall. Using my flat bar, I'll slowly go across, pull it off, and then label each trim piece for future reference. Then I'll do the same thing going around the rest of the room, but this is overall a pretty small job as I just have six different pieces of trim. Now one thing's gonna help you out when you're pulling that trim, make sure you're using a nice flat bar. That increased surface area when you're prying on the trim is gonna help you reduce the chances of damaging your trim. So although I like my little cat's paw here, this is not the right tool for the job and the surface area is so much less that you'll be able to remove the trim but you might split it in half. So even after you finish up all your trim pieces, just to make sure you're completely done, go through and make sure any of those left behind nails are removed from the drywall. Now moving on to the toilet, I'm gonna to start with the tank by shutting off the water, flushing the water out of the tank, and then removing the rest of the water with a sponge. Once the water is removed, then I'll remove the three mounting bolts that attach the tank to the toilet base and I set everything in the tank so I don't lose those parts later on. Then I'll remove the hose here that's going to the shutoff valve and remove the tank setting it off to the side. Moving on to the base now, I'll remove the two mounting bolts that attach the toilet to the flange on the floor. Once those are removed, I'll get a good hold on it, pull it off the flange and then dump the water into this tub to make sure that I don't have any extra water that's gonna dump all over the floor. Now I wanna remove the old wax ring, just setting myself up so I'll be able to install it after we get the flooring in place. Once that's all removed, then I'll take a 55 gallon drum liner, wrap it around the toilet, and then take it out of the room. Now don't forget, clean up with some shop towels and then put those shop towels in your drain pipe, ensuring nothing's gonna go down the drain during demo. Now with the vanity top, I'll make sure the main water shutoff is off and all the water's drained down. Then I'm gonna score the silicone, just breaking it loose between the wall and the vanity top. But before pulling the vanity top off, I wanna make sure I remove the P-trap for the drain line. And then also, you can see I don't have shutoff valves here, so I need to remove these water lines and then cap these so I can turn the water on during this project and not have a leak. Now each one of us is gonna have a little different experience here. Some of these vanity tops will pluck right off, no problem. Others you're gonna to have to work at a little bit more like I do here. So I'm gonna to continue to work the silicone with my utility knife and see if I can break the left or right hand side loose. Now you might need to get a little bit more leverage with a pry bar or I'm gonna use my small cat's paw 
But remember, do not just press against the front face of the vanity. You want to make sure you have a cross member in there. That's why I'm working just on that side. Then I'll go along the back side, making sure it's broke loose. And then finally pull it loose where I can pull it up and out. Now remember, this is pretty heavy, so you might need a little help with this to get it removed from the bathroom. But in my instance, a big issue was the vanity was actually inset into the drywall on the right hand side, and that's why I was having so much issue getting it removed. Now moving on to the surround, I'll start off by just removing these glass doors. There's a few small screws in the bottom, which allows you to take the doors off the rails and remove the top piece. Then with just a simple screws and a pry bar. Now if yours is in good condition, you might want to take your time because you could resell that or give it away to somebody for free. Then I'll remove the shower arm and remove the rest of the trim pieces in prep to start cutting out this one piece fiberglass surround. Remove the tub spout and then finally moving on to the drain. And sometimes it's nice to have these specialty tools which make the job much, much easier. With the use of a screwdriver, we can just loosen up that drain. And then we'll have all of our trim pieces removed. And don't forget, plug that drain so you don't get debris down it as you're removing the surround. Then I'll just use this 1x10 board as a template to offset a cut line. And I'm going to remove a little trim around the window so I'm prepping for future drywall work once I get the new surround in. Then I'll just use a level here to extend out that line and then switch to my oscillating tool, having eye protection and also wearing a mask while I remove this drywall. Continuing the cut line all around and then cutting that corner bead, I'll start to remove the rest of the drywall Trying to reduce the amount of drywall damage I do above the cut line because that's just more I'll have to repair later. Now if you want to reduce the mess, you can also use your shop vac right next to your oscillating tool, which will cut down on the dust. Then with my reciprocating saw and a short metal blade, I'll start cutting out these sections. I'm going to cut it out from side to side in the back, so three sections, and then just remove the bottom tub. Now be careful as you're cutting, you always want to make sure your blade is not going into the wall cavity because you could hit some plumbing or like this, you'll see a piece of Romex, which is in the neighboring bedroom and you definitely don't want to be cutting through your wires or your plumbing. And then we'll just finish this off and now we'll have everything down to the studs. Now moving on to the floor, I'm gonna loosen up the toilet flange here because I wanna take up, I have two layers of flooring and then a half inch of subfloor that is sitting on top of three quarters of an inch of subfloor. So I'm gonna take off the vent, the toe kick here, and then finish off removing the threshold at the entrance of the bathroom. Then you can see that half inch with those two layers of floor, that's what we're gonna take up. Instead of trying to scrape the floor off, we're going ahead and set the circular saw to a half inch. So we just cut through that first layer of subfloor, and then you can finish it off when you get close to the walls with an oscillating tool. So I bite off kind of manageable sections, and then I cut around that toilet flange so I can remove this section without fighting the toilet flange. Depending on how many nails the last person used to install said subfloor, you might need a larger pry bar. Here I have a 24 inch and a 36 or 42 inch pry bar would even be better and that extra leverage will come in handy. And then I use my small 12 inch cat's paw to just pull up all those nails as I continue to work across the floor. So I'll just continue to work small sections and progressing across the bathroom now remember, if you cut out a section, you start prying it, and you just can't get that leverage, don't fight it too much. Just cut out a smaller section. That'll make it more manageable, and you'll keep progressing without wearing yourself out. And then I use a toe kick saw right up to the vanity base because we're keeping the vanity in place. 
You can either get that at Harbor Freight, sometimes you can rent it from Home Depot, or you can look down in the description of this video and you'll see it in our Amazon store under the Power Tools section. So I'll finish this all up and then I'll remove all the remaining nails. I will sweep up and also use a shop vac just to get everything down to that clean three quarters of an inch subfloor on top of my floor joist. Now moving on to lighting. So we had mentioned this vanity lights going from the ceiling and will be mounted to the wall. It gives us more options on fixtures that we can pick and it'll just look a lot better. Now I wanna remove this light fixture now so I can patch the ceiling, do the drywall work that I need and position that new electrical box on the wall, but I don't wanna lose the lighting. So what I usually do is I use these temporary light sockets and then I put a 100 watt LED bulb to actually give us some light. And the trick is I use two pin Waga lever nuts. So I always have this unit sitting in my truck or readily available. If I need some temporary light, all I have to do is undo this light fixture, turn off the power, get my hot and my neutral wires, put those into the two pin, close these, and now I have a temporary light. And when I'm done, all I have to do is lift that lever nut up and now I can take the unit back off, store it in my truck, and it's ready for the next project. So it's super handy for projects like this, so you can have temporary lights that are easy to install and remove. So that'll be a quick little transition, but the bigger project is right here. I'm gonna take this light, the ceiling light, and I'm gonna convert that over to an exhaust fan, so when they flip the light switch, it actually turns on the light in the exhaust fan, but also the exhaust fan itself. Since this is a rental and an Airbnb, I wanna make sure anytime somebody has light on in the bathroom, that that exhaust fan's going, pulling out humidity, and hopefully reducing any chances of mold in the future. So let's jump into the exhaust fan and I'll show you how to convert that over. I'm just gonna quickly remove the old vanity light, check with my non-contact voltage tester to make sure my power's off, undo that light, and then get that temporary 100 watt LED light bulb installed by just connecting the two Wago lever nuts and then testing it out. And now up in the attic, I'm taking a look at that light location, the mounting bracket and electrical box, and also checking the spacing between the rafters. I just want to plan out to make sure I have enough space and nothing is going to interfere with the exhaust fan itself. So back down in the bathroom, we're gonna look at the light location with respect to the window, then go outside, use that same location with respect to the window, knowing this is where my vent is gonna go through the soffit. So just making sure nothing's gonna conflict with that plan. So we'll take out the ceiling light first, just a couple bolts, and also checking to make sure again the power's off before undoing the wiring. Once we have that off, then we'll jump up in the attic and with a small cat's paw pry bar, We'll just pop off that support bracket and the electrical box and undo the Romex. Then I'll put the exhaust fan housing in place temporarily and make sure the wire will reach. Once we have that in place, then I jump back down and I use a roto zip with a vacuum attachment to follow the housing around and then cut that exact pattern out of the ceiling, which makes quick work of this type of cut. Then from the outside, I'll take a spade bit and I'll just start a cut on the six inch hole for the vent. Then I'll use my sawzall with a short wood blade that's pretty skinny and makes it easy to go around an arc or a circle like this. Now I need to do that in the wood, but also cut it out of the aluminum soffit as well. Then once the hole is cut out, I will fish some electrical fish tape up in the attic and that's what's going to help me pull this flexible pipe out. So once the flexible pipe is mounted, and I'm using flexible pipe because I have a pretty small space to pull this out of the soffit. Not necessarily my favorite thing for this job and also you might want to get some insulated pipe just to make sure it doesn't condensate in your attic. But then I'll pull that fish tape out and then get the hose where right. we can route it and connect it up to the vent here in a step or two. There we go. Now once that's in place, then I'll go up and I'll do the wiring for the actual fan and also get it permanently mounted by adding two more screws. Pretty easy wiring using the Wago 221 lever nuts, which are awesome for DIYers and found in our Amazon store 
along with all of our other recommended tools. And you'll find a link in the description of our video. You can go over there, reference what tools and parts we're using for these different projects. So finishing up that wiring, and then you'll wanna make sure that you have a clamp on that cover, that the Romex and specifically the sheathing is actually pushed in and the clamp is tightened down on the sheathing of the Romex. Then we'll cut that flexible pipe put a four inch band clamp on it to attach it to the vent. And then once it's securely fastened, we'll attach it with three screws. Last thing is just the cover and the light. So we'll plug that in and then the two little leaf springs on each side, we'll get that mounted, push it up, make sure everything's fitting correctly, and then try out the light. All right, so we're moving on to installing the tub now, but I just wanted to point out, if you think this is going a little bit too fast for you and you're not getting all the information you need to apply that to your own project, there's a few more resources that can help you out, and all of those are gonna be down in the description below the video. So the resources are gonna be, I'll have separate videos for many of these different parts of this project that will go more in depth and will give you more instruction. So you can just select the one that you're on, click on that, and it's gonna be a longer form, more in depth focus on each individual topic. And then the other resources, there are some great courses out there for a pretty reasonable price, usually between 50 and $100. And that will walk you through kind of installing a shower tub and the tile surround or tearing into an older home rehab project, which can bring up a lot more complexity than what I'm showing here. There are courses that might be right for you. So you can also see those down in the description. They're not my courses, but they're guys that have decades of experience. I trust and I think would be a great resource if that's something you're looking for. But for now, let's move on to getting the tub in place. So with the main water shut off, I'm cutting the lines and then I'm putting the half inch shark bite caps on, which are super handy on projects like this. So you can turn the water back onto your house, but have these kept off without any leaks. And then just remove the old copper. Before confirming my measurements, I have 60 and 1 8 of an inch, which is gonna give me a five foot tub. And then I have the 32 inch width, which is gonna accommodate my Delta 400 series acrylic tub that I wanna get into place. Now just making sure I'm ready to place the tub, I'm checking the subfloor side to side to make sure it's level with a four foot bubble level and then front to back. Side to side, I was looking good. Now front to back, I'm a little bit off where it's sloping down towards the drain side. So what I do is just take a shim, place it under the four foot bubble level until the bubble's in the middle. And then I mark that on the shim and then that's what I can measure to see how far off I am. In my case, it's one eighth of an inch off which is kind of right on the borderline. I'm gonna put it in place and then see how everything's lining up. If it's more than that off, you're probably gonna to have to put a bed of mortar down below the base. So now you wanna check your walls. Taking that same bubble level, I'll span it across the front wall studs, making sure all the studs are touching the level. And then also check for plumb in the vertical direction, make sure the bubble's in the middle to make sure there's no issues. Now taking that front wall, because I know those studs are solid, I'll check with a square and see how those back studs and how the corner is. And I do see a bit of a gap there where I'm gonna have to accommodate for that. If you had something to set in and you need to get your stud surface out, you can sister in a new stud that usually would go the length of your wall, but you would get this outside face of this new stud where you want it and then you would attach it to your existing stud and that gives you your new surface that is now in the position that you want it. Alternatively, if you have a smaller gap, you can get a furring strip. Now I wouldn't buy these. What I usually do, uh, especially if I'm at the job site, I just have my circular saw. I actually take a set of vice grips. I put those on the guard for the circular saw at the dimension I want and then I rip down a furring strip. For instance, this one's set at about a quarter of an inch, and this might be what I'm gonna need here for the corner piece, where then I would just take some brad nails, brad nail that in place, and now my outside surface is where I want it by use of the furring strip. Now, if you have a very small gap, then you might be just using some simple shims, uh, like a plastic shim like this. So you have a few different options depending on how your wall surfaces are and how far out they are. 
Now a few items to take care of before setting and dry fitting in the tub. You'll put the apron support in place by laying down a bead of adhesive sealant that's called out in the instructions for the Delta 400 series. Line up your two mounting po posts, tap those down to make sure they're secure, and then press that front edge of the support against the apron, making sure the support is lower than the, the bottom edge of that white apron. So that will actually hit the floor, not the support. And then once you get it in place where you want it, then I'll tape it. I'll leave that hammer on for a little bit of weight and let it sit for half an hour. And then the other item I'm gonna take care of is put this 19 inch long two by four in place. And this is gonna give me a screwing surface on the front flange that's away from the drain side. Without it, I wouldn't have anything to screw the tub into. So I'll put the tub in place now and I'm just making my final confirmation and also to make sure the tub's setting on the floor without any issues where I might have to put that bed of mortar down. If everything looks good, I also make plans for furring strips or shims and also get the cardboard cutout from the box to protect the base so I don't scratch the acrylic. Then I'll remove that tub back out and start to put together my overflow and drain kit. Now I got the kit where you have to build it out yourself with inch and a half schedule 40 PVC. You just measure it off, cut it, and then you'll start gluing all of your joints together. Now once everything looks good and is glued together, before setting the tub back, back in place, you'll actually take that overflow out so you can get the tub back in the wall. So with the tub back in, now I'm using a small drill bit and a countersink to drill the pilot holes with a countersink because I'm gonna use inch and a quarter deck screws and I wanna make sure they sink in flush with the flange and don't stick out proud, which might interfere with the tub surround. So with my impact driver, I'll go ahead and sink all those inch and a quarter deck screws, putting shims in place where I need it and the one furring strip in the corner. And also on those front edges, you wanna make sure that those are plumb prior to screwing them in. Then with the tub secured, I'll put down a bead of 100% silicone on the drain and start to secure the overflow and drain itself. With that in place, now I'm gonna build out my P-trap connecting up to the existing plumbing. So I'll start to size things out, get my measurements, cut the PVC down with a ratchet pipe cutter and then dry fit it to everything fits. Once everything fits and I've confirmed it, then I will glue those pieces together and then complete the install of the drain. Moving on to our water lines, let me show you how to get this rough in, this Delta R10,000 mixing valve, tub spout, and shower adapter all installed. Now I'm gonna convert from the old copper half inch pipes and use shark bite fittings. For this application, they're perfect. It's down in the crawl space. I'm not worried about them linking and I'm just gonna use these couplers that go from half inch copper to half inch packs and are very convenient for DIYers. And now I have the half inch shark bite caps on there, which I'll go ahead and cut my copper lines to length again, down in the crawl space, so in the future I can access these if I need to. Taking that cap off, I always have those half inch caps on me at any given time. Now when you cut your copper lines, don't forget to deburr those with a deburring tool and some emery cloth. The shark bite part that actually seals it is an O-ring, so it would be susceptible to getting cut if there's any shark, if there are any burrs left, it would cut the O-ring and that could cause you some issues. Now don't forget to mark the depth that you need to press the shark bite onto your fitting. And for these half inch, it's right at about an inch, just a little bit under an inch, but you need those reference marks to make sure you're making a good connection and you're not gonna have any issues. And next up will be with the R10,000 Delta. Now you can solder in PEX adapters here, but I'm just gonna use threaded, straight threaded adapters. Do not use the angled 90 degree elbows because you're gonna have a hard time tightening those up, getting them pointing to where you wanted and also without any leaks. So just use the straights. And I'll use some Teflon tape and pipe dope. And I just wanna call out that if you guys need more detail, I have this video and many other videos that dive in much more detail if you wanna focus in on any one of the sections here in this DIY bathroom remodel. So we'll just tighten all these up, and then I'm gonna go ahead and crimp on any of the pecs 
lines that I can. So really to the tub spout, the shower arm, and then also the stubs coming out from the hot and cold, checking with a go, no-go gauge. Now I want to mount that valve. So I'm just using a laser. I'm gonna put that crosshairs right on the handle portion of the valve and then screw that into the blocking that I placed earlier. Now we'll go ahead and position the shower arm. Again, dimensions and the depth in the wall, all that's gonna be on that focus video down in the description if you wanna go over that for your own job. One thing I do differently, the tub spot here is a half inch. I would upgrade that to a three quarter inch just to reduce the amount of restriction of that water flow compared to this half inch that I installed. Now marking these 90s, I'll trim the water lines coming out of the crawl space and then crimp it on some elbows and then get that all completed. And that's all there is to get your shower valve and water lines plumbed in with PEX. Moving on, now I'll do the three piece tub surround. It's the same product, Delta 400 series. It's acrylic, so it's plastic and fairly flexible. So we need to reinforce it. Starting off with inserting two blocks in the middle of the largest wall panel. These will help, these will put adhesive on them and then those will hold that panel and give it a lot more structure. Additionally, around the top and sides you have flanges. So I needed to install this extra two by four so I had something to drill into. First up, you start dry fitting. So this is the largest panel. Again, I'm going to drill and countersink at each one of the studs and then use those inch and a quarter deck screws to hold it in place. Adding a small stud here, this will help me give me some screwing surface for the second panel that I'll be bringing in right here. Now I'll just hold this in place and then use my level on the outside to make sure everything is plumb, then secure it. Again, this is the dry fit stage, so this is where we want to check all of our gaps, make sure everything's plumb and leveled up. And this is the hardest part is your third section is at your tub spout and your valve. So you got to get your exact measurements because we need to cut those holes in that acrylic tub surround section and you only want to be cutting that once. To do that, we'll use just a template here, cardboard. We'll cut those holes, line them up, make sure everything is good. Then we'll transfer these measurements onto the actual panel itself. I'll be cutting from the back. The large hole saw is a three and a half inch hole saw and the small is an inch or an inch and an eighth for the little tub spout. Again, you wanna measure twice or even three times and cut once on this. Now I run that in reverse. The hole saw is in reverse. The acrylic's easy to cut and that will reduce the chances of any damage. So here's the real moment of truth. You're kind of questioning your measurements as you fit this up. All right, tub spout at least matches. So last few things on the dry fit, we'll just mount everything up, check level, and then also we will install a heat resistant patch on the back of the plumbing side, just in case someone needs to do some soldering in the future. Now specifically for adhesives and sealants, adhesive, I'm gonna use the Loctite adhesive for tubs and surround. Now for sealants it can be a bit tricky. I'm using this hybrid amp from DAP. It does work with acrylic. That's the key is because this is an acrylic tub surround, a lot of your different sealants actually do not bond very well to acrylic. So first up, I'll lay down the adhesive on the studs for this larger panel. Once all the adhesive is in place and I had marked the top of that flange to make sure I don't go too far, then I'll lay down the sealant right at the interface of the panel and the tub. Once we have that, you'll grab your panel and then sink all your screws to hold it in place. Do pay attention, the bottom part of this is really not supported and these side panels you'll need to push in place and then secure your screws to make sure it holds the bottom part of that larger panel in place. So you'll push on that outside and then set your screws in place to make sure everything's tight. Installing the last panel here, we'll set our screws 
And then once you have everything in place, you need to support this. I use these adjustable supports here and you'll see a link in the description for your reference. I put two across the smaller panels and then two going from a wall to the larger panel. And don't press too hard, but you want to make sure it's firmly pressing so that adhesive sets up. Now you wanna let this sit for at least 24 hours to make sure everything bonds and the overall surrounds are solid. Then once that's done, you'll just go through and then you'll seal all the different seams to make sure you have a watertight finish. And you'll be surprised if done right, how much this will firm everything up and the, now this flimsy acrylic surround will feel actually very solid. Let's move on to the vanity now. And you had seen me remove that old vanity top earlier and also talk about the light fixture currently coming from the ceiling, but we wanna get that moved to the wall. So we have a wider variety of light fixtures that we can choose from for a vanity light. Now, hopefully you have a 30 inch or a 36 inch base, which is gonna help you keep your cost down on getting a new vanity top. Now, if you can repurpose your vanity base, that's a great way to save money. I am going to keep this one in place. It's in good condition and they actually repainted it recently and looks pretty good. I will be swapping out the hardware just to update the look a little bit and get a new vanity top. But the thing that I really need to consider is this is actually a 60 inch enclave. So what that means is the vanity top is inset exactly into a 60 inch wide cavity in the wall. That really does limit my options because a 60 inch vanity top is actually 61 or 61 and an eighth wide. So that would be very hard to get in the space and I'd have to gouge out all the drywall and just would be a pain in the butt and not be a good finished product. So I'm gonna get a little creative here. I think it's gonna look good and it'll fit that exact 60 inch opening. But first, let's get that vanity light electrical box set. And because I need to do a little drywall work here, patching some old damage, I'm gonna just cut out the old drywall, replace new, but that's gonna open everything up for me and give me a path over here to the light switch. So I'm gonna take advantage of that repairing the drywall, but also to get a path to bring new Romex up to my new electrical box location. Let's jump into it. Now I'm going to use a what's called a pancake box and position that 85 inches off the floor and 30 inches off the wall right in the center of this enclave. Then I'll trace that out and then just use a jab saw. Now I could use an oscillating tool, but a jab saw, I just take my time and I kind of want to be careful because I have the PVC line coming up, which is my plumbing vent. Then I'll pop out that piece of drywall and then I'll run the Romex down and pre-install a clamp in the back of that pancake box, which will securely hold and protect the Romex as it passes through the metal outside of the pancake box. Then with two screws, I'll just hold that right in uh, on the stud. And then I'll prep my wires a little bit, stripping those down, and then also installing a grounding pigtail which will connect up once we install the vanity light. Now, instead of using these plates, right, to protect the wire in the wall, I like to use these easy guards. It's a product I found recently, and you can find a link in the description, or you can find them on our Amazon store underneath the electrical section. Then I'll just run the Romex over to the bay with the two gang box for my GFCI outlet and my switch. And I'm gonna run through this pretty quickly. So this isn't a complete guide of how to wire this up because all of our situations will be a little different. And specifically for this one, I am running my vanity light and as you saw earlier, my exhaust fan and exhaust fan light off the same switch. Because this is a rental, if there's light in the bathroom, it'd be great if the exhaust fan is on. So I just run it to one switch, which will hopefully help to reduce the amount of humidity in the bathroom. 
So I have built in clamps in this old metal electrical box, which I'm utilizing to bring that Romex up and through and providing a little slack there uh, as a service loop. So if I ever need more wire in the future, I can bring it up through. Now this house actually has a lot of soldered joints. So the neutrals and the hot coming in are soldered with electrical tape, protecting that soldered open wire. I do not want to shorten those wires anymore because they're already short. So I just put new electrical tape on those. Again, check your local code. Uh, and then also just make sure you're comfortable doing this work because ultimately it is your responsibility if you're taking on these electrical projects. Then we'll get everything mounted. We'll go turn the breaker on and then test out our temporary light, which turns on and make sure both of the GFCI receptacles work. Moving on to drywall, I wanna get all the pieces in place. So from one green board, which is mold resistant and ideal for bathrooms, I'll be able to get all my pieces. I'll do my first score line here with my four foot square. And then once I have that first score line, I'll double back going deeper. So then it's easy just to snap that drywall and then cut the backside to get my first piece loose. Then I'll just get my length, which is gonna be just over 60 inches going on the back of that vanity. Now, if you get your pieces in place and you have a little bit of interference, that's why I have that jab saw and my utility knife handy. You can just make small adjustments so you can get that piece in place and then start sinking your drywall screws. I just use my impact driver with a specific drywall uh, bit, sinking inch and a quarter drywall screws, which is ideal for a standard drywall install. Easy enough, just piecing all these in place. But not only do I have this vanity to finish up, but we need to double back to the bathroom surround, the bath and shower surround, where we cut out originally when we removed the old one. Same thing though, I'll just start to piece this in, sink my inch and a quarter, pretty straightforward. Now this next piece I did cut out with an inch and one eighth hole saw, the hole for the shower arm fitting. So you just have to place that correctly, cut that out, and then it should fit easily in place. Now I'll have smaller pieces here on the sides. These can be a little bit tricky because you'll have the flange from the surround and they'll wanna angle your drywall slightly. So don't sink your screws too deep or it'll pull through your drywall depending on, on how much difference you have in the measurements. So this last one, I'm gonna pre-drill the holes because basically it's two and a quarter inches and that entire width has a flange in place. So I just want to pre-drill it so I'm not cracking that flange on the surround. So now starting the mudding process, I'm a complete amateur when it comes to this, so I have a lot of sanding I have to do. So when I have a home like this, where I have this side of the home where it has furniture, it is not a construction project, and then a bathroom project like this that is a complete construction zone, I do like to put up a barrier and isolate those two sides because I don't want to get drywall dust all over everything. Now, it's easier said than done, but at least one thing you can do is I use this little zip wall system. So with just a little bit of plastic, this is a little bit thicker plastic in two mil, pretty cheap at any home improvement store and the zip wall system. If you need a reference, again, you can see it in my Amazon store under the drywall section, you'll see zip wall. So let me show you how that works and it'll help isolating these two areas. So hopefully you reduce the mess in the rest of your home. I start off, I just get a couple pieces of tape on the top and both sides. Then I cut the plastic to length. And what I want to do is with those pieces of tape, just secure it to either the trim or the wall, getting it fairly tight and secure around the door opening itself. Then once I have that, I'll place one or two, I like to do two of these zip wall zippers and secure that onto the plastic. Now, once those are secured, I'll go ahead and tape all the way around 
just getting a little better bond between the plastic and the wall and trim. Then I'll undo the zippers and with a utility knife, I'll just cut that plastic underneath the zippers, which will now open up the space so you can either have the temporary wall down or you can roll it up like this and get it out of your way. With a little prep work, just do a quick one over with a painter's tool, taking off any loose material, paint, chips, plaster, or your new drywall, making sure you're ready to start mudding. This is one of the parts of the project that kind of compounds on itself in terms of how long it's gonna take you if you don't have experience. If you don't have experience working with mud, it's kind of clunky, you're getting it all over the place, it doesn't go where you want, it's not smoothing out like you want, and then you have to sand a whole lot more than the pros would have to because you added a ton of extra material or you just weren't able to smooth that out the way you wanted it. So I'll be going through a three-step process. The first step, I'm just gonna be filling any large gaps or where I have new drywall and the old drywall and we have a little bit of a lip. I kinda of wanna fill that in, smooth that out and, and let that mud set up before I go on to phase two where we'll be taping all those seams and then doing the one outside corner bead that I have to replace right behind me. And then phase or step three is kind of a skim coat, getting everything smooth and feathered out if you had a large transition and hopefully reducing the amount of sanding you have to do. But again, as a DIYer, you're probably gonna have to do quite a bit of sanding to get it to look reasonable and ready for paint. The tools of the trade and what I use, so I have a stainless steel mud pan. I do recommend getting one of these, not a plastic one. Spend a few more dollars, get a stainless steel pan. And then the three different knives that I use, I use a six inch, a 10 inch, and a 14 inch, kind of stepping through those three different steps. So I won't even use these two on that first step. I'll just use a six inch to mix everything up in my mud pan, and then also to apply that filler, kind of getting those gaps filled and those transitions, starting to fill those in a little bit. So I always have a bucket of water because I'm using a dry joint compound, and this is a hot mud, a 45 minute hot mud, so it will set up within 45 minutes. So you only have a certain working window. Now, if you're a DIY for the first time and you're like, oh, five minute or 15 minute hot mud, that's awesome, it won't take any time to dry. Caution, that's gonna set up really quickly, and remember, that's gonna be really hard to work with. So 45 minute is kind of my go-to. That is why I have it in a Christmas popcorn tin. It's just something I always have where I can mix up a small batch for a job, get that on the wall, and then just store this later on, not wasting a bunch of material. A lot of you will probably be tempted to get the five gallon dark green cap all-purpose joint compound. That's fine, just don't forget you should be mixing that before using it. Don't just scoop that right out of the bucket and go to work because that's gonna be hard to get a nice smooth consistency as you're looking for. And if you need a lot more tips and tricks from an actual pro, I would recommend the Vancouver Carpenter. I've seen him for years and years and it seems like he has pretty much a video for all the different types of situations that you would encounter and he has a ton more experience that's gonna help you through your project. But with that said, I'm going to mix up my first batch and then apply that step one filling in all those gaps. So I just start off with some water from the bucket and then I apply the dry mix itself. With a six inch knife, I'll work that mix together and just get a look and see how runny it is initially to see if I need to add more powder or not. I like to stay a little conservative with the mix and then add a little bit of powder in later on. You can take kind of either approach, just making small changes, and this is the consistency that I'm getting for this first coat. Now it's been a little while, so my technique is definitely a little rough, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily recommend uh, the way I go about this, but what I'm trying to do here is just fill that new green board, because it is a little lower than the old surface. So I'm just trying to fill that in. I'm getting it to a level where the next time I go through, I'm getting it more to the final finish. Here, I just want to fill any gaps and uneven surfaces between the old to new. So I'll fill my inside corners as well. Here on the back, I'm really just spotting the gaps. So that's why I keep squatting down. I'm just looking for the gaps to fill uh, because they're actually both about at the same uh, distance away from the wall, so I'm not really filling one more than the other. Now on this far side wall, I do have 
a chunk of drywall that was knocked out for the old vanity top. So I do need to fill that in. Now, just take a note that that's gonna take longer to dry. That's gonna take probably four or five hours to dry just because the thickness is about a, I'd say a quarter to a half an inch. Now this is gonna be my only outside corner, so I will be putting a corner bead on this one. So all I'm doing here is again, just filling between that new green board and the old wall surface. And going through here, uh, again, gaps. Uh, and this is at a slight angle, so I'm gonna have to kind of build this up a little bit more and then feather that to the old surfaces. You always wanna stay kind of one step ahead knowing where you want to fill and not kind of thinking through that for the first time when you get to that part of the wall, especially as a DIYer, because you're not gonna have enough time with your mix before it starts setting up. Even with the 45, it'll start setting up in that, you know, 15, 20 minutes where it is a little bit, um, the consistency changes and it's a little bit harder to strike off. And then once you're done with that step one, make sure you clean up your tool so you're ready to go for the next step. Another point that I would do before actually applying the mud for step two, I check all of my screws. I just use either your knife or a painter's tool. So you can hear that metal screw as I work the painter's tool across the surface. That's not good. So all you have to do is just have a Phillips head screwdriver with you and just set that slightly in so that mud can go on the top of it and you won't have a fastener poking out. And then just confirm that. Okay, so we no longer have any clicking sounds, making sure that our screws are where they should be. Additionally, if you have any corner beads, this is an exterior corner that we're gonna put a bead on. This is a bead where it's metal uh, on the actual bead itself, and then it has paper. I think these are great for DIYers because we're gonna fill mud on the inside here, and then we're gonna place that on the actual bead. We're gonna get it to where we want it, and then we'll strike that mud out. We'll smooth everything off, letting that set up, and then now we'll have a nice corner established. So once you've done your light sanding, you make sure all your screws are below the drywall surface and you have your corner bead ready. Now you're ready to mix up your next round of hot mud and start going through your second application. So it's critical that you get plenty of mud inside this corner bead. So when we apply it to the actual exterior corner, we'll be able to strike the paper side on both sides and get the mud to squish out from under the paper. And that gives you the adhesion to the wall surface. If you go a little light on your mud, it can be hard to get that paper to sit down. And also I would mix up a small batch and just focus on your corner bead opposed to doing the corner bead and all your other wall surfaces because your mud can start to set up and then you kind of get yourself into a little situation. Once you build up your experience, you'll be able to work through these things at five or 10 times the pace uh, when you're starting out. So the mud's almost set up. You can see a little bit more gray in that back corner that needs to dry out completely white. And then I can start to do some light sanding before putting on the tape. As we get into sanding, I would like to stress to you, try to keep your space clean, especially if this is a rehab project where the rest of the house is being lived in and it's not a rehab project. If you just start going crazy with sanding, creating a lot of dust, it will go absolutely everywhere in your home. One tip is to get that zip wall system that I installed and also be sure that you're pulling a small vacuum. What you wanna make sure is that your HVAC system is off during the sanding, especially when you have a vent inside the bathroom, because what you'll notice is when you zip that wall, it's still pushing out. Air is wanting to push out underneath that wall. So dust will go out underneath that wall and go into your home. You wanna see a small vacuum. So you shut off your HVAC and maybe just with your exhaust fan running or a fan in a window if you have it, you want to pull a vacuum and see that plastic zip wall pull into the bathroom showing that it's pulling air from the rest of your home and then that would reduce the amount of drywall dust that's going to go into the rest of your home as you're sanding. So I'm going to jump into that light sanding and start putting down the tape. 
So hopefully you don't have much to knock down here so you can reduce the amount of powder or dust you're creating. Here it's not too bad, but actually between each step, as I'll be going on the taping, I do like to just use the shop vac, clean the space up, again, so I'm not tracking dust around the house. I like mesh tape. It does adhere to the wall, and then you just smooth that out with your knife. And I also try to capture as many ends as I can. So I have these horizontal pieces and I capture those ends with the one vertical piece. I think the mesh is a little more forgiving for DIYers because it sticks by itself and you can kind of do your taping and then once you're done and you have all your mesh tape up, you can come back through with a thin coat of the hot mud on top, getting close to finishing off mudding. Now for the inside corners, I like to use paper. I think the paper tape works better, so I just cut it to length, I apply mud ahead of it, then I crease it into that corner, and it's just gonna make for a much better corner overall. And then I'll just put a little mud on top, strike that off, and then be done with this round. So I completed that step two of taping the seams and then also getting the paper in my inside corners, then did a light sanding, and then went through with step three on a very light skim coat, just smoothing everything out, and that is where I'm at right now. So one light sanding away, and then we'll start into painting. And then initially for your painting, don't forget any new drywall surface, you want to prime that before painting. Especially in the bathroom, you have a sheen to it, so it's wipeable and resistant to moisture. If you put that right down on fresh drywall, it'll take that sheen out of the paint, and then you'll kind of have a mixed match of sheen and reflection of light across your walls. So it just results in a really bad finished product. So don't forget your primer, and I am ready to get some paint on these walls after that light sanding. Now, a reminder, lower your zip wall system and make sure your HVAC is off so you're pulling a vacuum in that room, ensuring dust will not be going in the rest of the living space. Also, probably wearing a mask is a good idea. You're kicking up a lot of dust and fine particles depending on how much sanding you actually need to do. But overall, this should go fairly smoothly. And then once you're done, if you can go out in a living space, look across your surfaces and you don't have dust, that is mission accomplished and you know you sealed it off well. It's also probably a good idea to use a large damp sponge and just do one round wiping down all your walls, making sure the drywall dust is off before moving on to your primer. Now I'm just using a standard Promar 200 interior primer from Sherwin-Williams and a small two inch brush, which actually takes a little bit longer, especially because the new drywall surfaces are really gonna soak up that primer. Depending on how much drywall you did, you might wanna grab a roller and it'll make this part go much faster. I'm also doing a little prep for painting. So I will use some blues painter's tape and tape off the acrylic surround which lets me just go a little bit faster even in the primer stage because I'm not worried about getting primer actually on the surround itself. Primer's all dry and now it's time for the paint. Little YouTube magic and now we have paint on the walls. Now I went with Sherwin-Williams and their interior super paint lineup. Now for the ceiling, I just did extra white, no color added, and in the flat sheen for the super paint. And then for the walls, the code is SW6485. It's called Raindrop. So that's also super paint interior with a velvet sheen. That was two coats to get us to this for the walls. So just a heads up, you're gonna see the walls kind of switch back and forth in the rest of the video from still the mudding process to painted, and it's not gonna make complete sense since it doesn't seem to be chronological. Follow the video if you can in terms of get your painting done, move on to your flooring, once flooring's done, finish up your vanity, once vanity's done, hang your hardware. So follow the actual order of the video, even though you might see the walls jumping back and forth, which is just something I was working on from a time perspective as I was waiting for the mud to dry. I was trying to do some other steps as well. Moving on to flooring, I'm going with a vinyl plank. Now this is super common, especially in wet areas like your bathroom. 
The uncommon part of this is this is actually a very thin product because it is a glue down vinyl plank opposed to a floating vinyl plank where you're just clicking everything together and putting it across your room. That is much more common for DIYers, but I do prefer the glue vinyl plank because it's more resilient and also more serviceable. So if I have a gouge or damage later on, since this is a rental, I can heat this one plank up remove that plank and then reapply glue down and put a new plank in place. I always keep at least one extra box up in the attic to all my rentals and that gives me a better shot to being able to repair a small part of the floor instead of having to replace an entire floor. Now since that glue down vinyl plank is so thin your subfloor has to be in great shape. I actually already have quarter inch plywood down on top of my standard subfloor to give me a perfectly smooth surface. I'm going to actually secure that down right now with inch and a half screws. You can also use what are called narrow crown staples to staple all this down and secure it. And then don't forget at each one of the seams between your quarter inch plywood you want to put some type of floor leveler or patch to smooth that out ensuring the entire floor is smooth so when you put the glue down and the vinyl plank you have no ridges or creases showing through. So I'm going to jump in and start securing down this quarter inch plywood. Not a bad idea when you're screwing this down or using those narrow crown staplers to put more than you think you might need. You want this to be very secure to the floor. You want nothing underneath it. You don't want even dirt or any gravel underneath it because when you walk across that floor, you're going to feel it and possibly even hear it. And then when you're driving in those screws, you want to make sure they're below the surface. You don't want any poking up or you're going to, again, get that to poke up through the vinyl plank. Now, once you have your screws down, don't forget to fill any of these seams. It's really, you don't have to be that clean with this. It's something you can just push down in the seam, strike off, and it dries overall pretty quickly, easily within an hour. And then in addition to the seams, if you have any gaps where the quarter inch does not reach, let's say your tub surround here or by your vanity, just go ahead and fill those in as well and let those dry. Now, once that's dry, you want to clean everything up and make sure every one of those fasteners is below the level of the quarter inch and then just vacuum up and then you're ready to get your reference line here i'm just going to make one reference line prior to putting down the glue then i'll take the glue and i'll use 1 16th inch v trowel so it's a very shallow depth trowel which will be the thickness of the glue you want that'll take usually about an hour to set up and then you can start laying down your vinyl plank working the small cuts with your razor blade. Remember, a sharp razor blade is very smart to have during this process, but everything should go down pretty quickly and just take your time. Make sure you're matching factory edge to factory edge. So the floor is down. It's in really good shape. Just a few things. Make sure you have a roller so you can really press down and roll that vinyl plank onto your glue, making sure you have a good bond. And then that factory edge to factory edge, what happens if you don't do that? If you match a cut side to a factory edge, it looks a lot like this, and you can see you're gonna be more prone to small gaps. So just try to match those factory edges, and then your cut sides are either at your threshold or against your wall, and that will just make your overall end product much better. Now I also, you can see, have the trim almost all back in, and I wanted to reuse all that trim that I tore out right at the start, and I kept in good shape, the only problem is, remember, we removed a half inch of plywood below this. So what that did is I've only built up a quarter of an inch and then that very skinny 1 16th of an inch of the vinyl plank floor. So what that means is if I use my old trim, I would have some beat up drywall, some caulk, and some things that I did not address during the mudding phase. So what I did is I went ahead and purchased new trim because the wall surface is so minimal. And you can see it is much larger and that's gonna cover up any of those imperfections in the wall and give me a nice clean finish. Nothing fancy. Let me show you how to cut these last few pieces with a very inexpensive product. So with just a couple cuts needed, I'm just gonna use a miter box here, which would not be ideal if you were trimming a whole house. The one key is I would use some clamps here and clamp down the box and also 
the piece you're cutting. If you don't clamp it down, you're gonna be kind of fighting trying to hold it down while you make your cuts because the saw will grab a little bit depending on the depth of your cut. First piece done. Then you might also need a notch if you have something like a vanity where you have clearance issues. Just set that back in place. Then I'm just using an 18 gauge brad nailer. And you do wanna to try to hit studs. You'll obviously have a stud on the bottom, but then if you know there's any other studs in the wall, you wanna to try to hit those to hold your trim piece in place. Then you can go through with just some standard trim caulk. At any of your brad nails, filling those in. So now the trim piece is primed, we have our caulk down, and it's ready for our trim paint. So I'm gonna bypass the trim paint side of it. Just make sure you use painter's tape so you don't get any paint on your walls or on your new flooring. But I wanna get this temporary light swapped out to the new vanity light. I'm gonna work through that fairly quickly. Now, if you need in-depth instruction on any one of these parts, look down in the description and there'll be the entire list of deep dive step-by-step -step videos if you need more explanation on installing the vanity light. Awesome, look down there, select your video, and then dive a little bit deeper so you know exactly how to handle this. As this video really is that complete step-to-step -step bathroom remodel, I wanted to show you as many parts as possible, but of course can't dive too deep into each one. So let's swap this out and get some light back on in this room. So I used my non-contact voltage tester and confirmed no powers on at this fixture. Now that is a metal pancake box, which is already grounded. So this bracket, once installed, is actually bonded to that metal box and it also will have a ground. So you do not need to run a separate ground wire to that bracket. Using that torpedo level, I just want to make sure everything's leveled up once I tighten it so the fixture overall is level, even though you have a little bit of wiggle room or play. This is how easy the wiring is with these Wagos. Hot, neutral, ground, done. Just flipping three levers once you confirm they're fully seated in the transparent housing. Then we'll tighten up the two mounting nuts there and then start to place the shades on. And if you've ever done this before, you know these little nuts can cross that really easily. So this kit comes with this little wrench, which is handy, but you might need to start them off by hand just to make sure they don't cross thread. Take your time. It is always a bummer if you drop one of these shades, they shatter, and then you're taking a trip back to the home improvement store, hopefully to find a match. Then I'm gonna install some soft white light bulbs, turn the power back on, and test things out. Now for the vanity top, the sink, and the faucet, I want to get that done because that's really going to start to pull this bathroom together. If you recall, this is a 60 inch enclave, so I can't just go out and get an integrated top and sink together combo. For one, in my area, 60 and 72 inch wide vanity tops are much less available than 30 and 36, which you have a bunch of different options in stock at all your home improvement stores. And furthermore, I need exactly 60 inches. I can't use a standard 60 inch because that's gonna actually be 61 inch as you'd want a half inch overhang on both sides of your vanity. For me, that means it's a little bit of a custom solution, so let's start jumping into it. For the vanity top, I'm gonna to use a slab of poplar wood. And then I'm gonna cut it to length. So I'm cutting it right now to 60 inches, so it'll fit right within the enclave. Now, I don't have a track saw, so I'm just using this board as a straight edge, clamping that down, and then making sure my line is all lined up. 
and then making my cut supporting the piece that will fall off. Then I'll want to go ahead and cut it to width, doing the same thing with the straight edge for a guide on the circular saw. Clamp that down, set my depth, make sure I'm not cutting my saw horses, and then I'll make my cut. What I'm doing here is I wanna cut it to width, but I also want a little bit of an overhang on the front surface. So I'm just making three quarters of an inch of overhang to the vanity compared to the vanity top. Now we'll go ahead and dry fit that, just making sure that everything lines up and we don't need to make any further cuts. Looks great. And now we'll take the vessel sink and position that 30 inches from the wall right in the middle because I need to mark both the drain hole and also the faucet hole because I need to cut that out making sure they can pass through the actual wood surface. This is a three and one eighth hole saw for the drain. I need some extra clearance so I can get everything tightened up and make sure it's watertight once we install the drain. Then using a two inch hole saw, I cut the faucet hole out. And then once those two are cut, we'll clean things up. And then before staining, I wanna do a dry fit, making sure everything has clearance and it's lining up as expected and I didn't overlook anything. So I'll place the drain in, make sure I can tighten the nut on the bottom side, and then pass the water lines through for the faucet, set it in place, and just do a final confirmation. So everything looked good, but before putting the stain top back in place, I wanna lay down a thin bead of silicone around the perimeter of the vanity base and then two middle cross members. Then I'll bring in the stain top, angle that into place, but I do hit a bit of a snag. And that is when I cut the vanity top, I was not fully built out on the mud. So the surface has built out just a little bit, which is interfering now. I'll try it the other direction to see if I have a little better luck. It's a little bit better, but still some interference. So I'm just gonna have to bite the bullet, make a little drywall damage, and then correct that once everything is in place and secured. Then we'll take the vessel sink, make sure it's 30 inches on center to the drain and also the faucet hole. Make small adjustments. Once I have it in place, then I'm gonna use some blue painter's tape. And I, would just, I wanna just lay a reference down for the perimeter. And what this is gonna do is give me a quick reference because I wanna flip over and put some silicone on the bottom side of this sink that will hold it to the vanity top and hold it to the wall. So I'll just do this inside bead here. This is not to set a bead on the outside of the vessel sink. I'll do that later on, but this is actually to hold it to the surface. And then three blobs here that will go from the vessel sink to the wall. Now I can flip it over, reference my painter's tape, set it into place, and then make small adjustments. Once I'm completed with the entire project, I will go back through and kind of waterproof everything, putting some silicone along the edge here, and then also between the vanity top and the wall all the way around the perimeter, just to make it a little bit more watertight. For your reference, I used two coats of the Minwax, which is the stain and poly in one. And then this is aged barrel for the color in a satin finish. In addition to the silicone holding the vanity top to the vanity, I do have four additional screws where I drilled pilot holes and then set those in the corner. But remember, if you're going to do that, do not over tighten those. The corner pieces of wood will pop right off if you over tighten them. So you're just snugging those up, giving a little bit more hold there, but do not over tighten. So now I'm gonna hook up the drain and the faucet and get this sink operational. Starting off with the actual tailpiece and the stopper, I'll apply silicone to that top nut, making sure it gets a good seal between that surface and the actual vessel sink itself, wiping off any excess. And then with the faucet, actually I got a bit of a snag here. I'm not gonna have access to that faucet to tighten it down. So I actually need the vessel sink off the top. Remember we siliconed in place. So actually I'm going to have to pry this up with a flathead and then scrape that old silicone off, which actually gave a pretty good hold, uh, but it wasn't fully set up yet. So it wasn't too bad to pry off. So scraping off all the old silicone 
and then putting in new. I put that blue tape back down just so I have easy reference where it should go with that faucet installed, setting it in place. Now I have a secure faucet and I can finish up on that tailpiece and drain stopper. Finishing up the connections here down in the vanity and just a few things to note. So on the left side, that should be your hot line. These are quarter turn shark bite on off valves with a 3 8 inch outlet, which is going to be the standard size you're expecting. Now I took a inch and a half heavy duty P trap here going into our PVC adapter into the wall. And then this is going to go up to the tailpiece here. Now your vanity sink is usually inch and a quarter. So I'll just get an extension here, which is an inch and a quarter as well. And then at this interface down here, that's when you're switching over from inch and a quarter to inch and a half. That's no big deal. Just you're going to put the nut on here and then you need to select between these two to make sure you get the right one. So this would be if I had inch and a half to inch and a half, and then this is going to make up for that difference, and that's going to be the one you want to use to ensure you convert over from inch and a quarter going into inch and a half. Now, if you want to go inch and a quarter all the way to the wall, that's fine. I just like to have a little more capacity in my P-trap. The only other thing I'll do is I will I'll go ahead and connect up the drain stopper and then test everything out, ensuring no leaks at the shutoff valve, and then obviously no leaks within the drain line and the P-trap. Now there's three main sections to testing out to make sure you have no leaks. First is just testing cold and hot running water to see if your shutoff valves have any leaks. Then once you have that, I go ahead and fill up the sink, and what I'm looking to do is fill it all the way up to the overflow and have water go through that overflow, testing out that path, ensuring no leaks. Then once you have that, I'll go ahead and pop the stopper up and drain a large amount of water through all at once to see, again, if that larger flow of water would create any leaks. If not, if everything's watertight, then you are good at the vanity. Installing the trim pieces, your shower arm, pretty straightforward. Now your tub spout rough in, if you went with Delta, you probably got one of these adapters. This is my preferred method of attaching tub spouts because I feel like it gives you a little flexibility to tighten the tub spout. And because the seal is being made at the O-ring, you can get the tub spout oriented perfectly up and down where you want it and you're not also hoping that it's tight on the actual pipe like if you have a threaded connection with Teflon tape. So let me show you how this goes on. So per the instructions, you'd want your adapter back surface to be right at your tub surround or within a quarter of an inch. So I actually have marked with a Sharpie a quarter of an inch. Now you need to cut your rough in though out at the front surface. So I'm just going to make a small mark here because that is actually where I'm going to cut the rough in. Also this, for whatever reason, this rough in, they put the UPC sticker all the way along here. So you actually have to remove that sticker because again, the seal is going to be with an internal O-ring that's right about here in the adapter. So you got to make sure that's completely clean so that O-ring can make a nice seal with the copper tube. Now since we are dealing with an O-ring, and even if we weren't, it is a good idea to make sure you have all the burrs off of this and it's nice and smooth. What I like about this is I'm going to use the set screw to secure it on this pipe. If this failed in the future, if the O-ring failed, the set screw just wasn't going to set, no problem, I can take the set screw out, take that O-ring out, put it on the same copper pipe, and I can sweat this adapter, making the secure connection with the solder joint with the same parts that I have here. So even if you don't like the O-ring, you wanna sweat it, sweat it right now, but if the O-ring gives you issues, you can just swap that out in the future. What I am gonna do is use some Loctite thread locker blue and just put a dab on the set screw to try to hold that in place once we tighten it long term so it doesn't want to back out. You can do the same thing on your towel rods, your toilet paper holder, and 
anything else with that set screw that has a tendency of backing out and causing you problems. And then you just press it in until that copper pipe is flush with the outer face of the adapter. Then you'll just take your Allen wrench and then tighten up your set screw. Then once you have everything tight, you can just take your tub spout and thread that right onto the adapter. And then you'll start to get snug to your surround. And then you won't want to over tighten it, but just tighten it enough where everything's snug and you have your tub spout pointing straight down. And that's it. Now getting ready to set the toilet back in place and my PVC drain line is in good shape but the flange is not. I have a blowout here on the one side, so that's not gonna hold the two mounting bolts for the base of the toilet, but I'll show you how we'll easily address that with a repair flange. So with an oscillating tool, I'm gonna to make some small adjustments or trims to the old flange. Why I'm doing that is I wanna make sure there's no interference to the slots that your two mounting bolts will go into for your new metal flange. Oscillating tools make quick work of that, and once clearance is confirmed, then you can start to set your screws in. Overall, pretty easy, and it, the OD flange does give you some slots to make adjustments, and then some holes once you're confirmed that you have the position correct. Now you'd place your two mounting bolts, and then go get your toilet base with the wax ring already installed setting that into place. I like these break off bolt mounting bolts. So you'll tighten down your nut. You don't have to over tighten. You just want to compress down that wax ring and also have your toilet base secure on the floor. Then even with these snap off bolts, I like to use a hacksaw and just cut them slightly so the snap is very easy. Then you can just clean up a little bit with a sponge and place your cap on top. Now with that secure base, we're going to move on to the tank. The tank usually has a couple mounting bolts. This one has three and you kind of go back and forth. You'll thread one on just starting to tighten down the seal, then go to the next. Don't tighten one all the way down, then move to the next because that will result in a leak on that side that you tightened last. Connecting up the water line to the shot up valve. Now I'm ready to test it out once we have everything tightened up. So we'll turn the water on and I'll just look for any leaks, tightening up the mounting bolts or the water line as needed to confirm no leaks as that water fills in the tank. And you'll want to run a few cycles through your toilet, just making sure everything is watertight and you won't have any issues moving forward. So the major systems are all in our vanity, our toilet, our shower tub are all up and running and we don't have any leaks. Now there's a few items that I need to knock off real quickly, but don't take off just yet because we're going to go through the budget. What was the final budget for this project? Remember our original target was a $1,500 DIY complete bathroom remodel. What are the lessons learned? What are things that I might have done differently? So you can apply those same lessons learned to your project and hopefully save on any headaches. And then finally, we'll finish up and I want to let you know how to save on projects like this at your big home improvement stores. There's some systems that are usually reserved for pros at those stores that you can leverage as a DIYer and save significantly on these projects. So let me hang a couple things here and then we'll touch on those topics. I'm going to mount a curved shower rod. Now this is a rental, so I do like to have a securely mounted shower rod compared to ones that you just twist and kind of compress between the drywall. Overall, it's pretty easy and it'll hold up a little bit better over time. Once that is installed, now I'm going on to the towel, a 24 inch towel rod. Now I prefer to have at least one side into studs but you're not gonna have both sides. So then I'll compare that, get my markings for my next mounting bracket, sinking in some metal drywall anchors. These are my go-to drywall anchors. Uh, my last resort, if this does not hold, is toggle bolts. I think toggle bolts are a great repair later on if this pulls out of the wall. And then for those set screws, don't forget, I'm using blue Loctite thread locker which will hopefully hold this long term and then those set screws won't back out like they usually do. 
for the towel ring, again, going for a stud. If you hit stud, it makes it so much easier. Two screws and then that set screw and you're good to go. Putting the thread locker on so it will hold long term. And I spent a little bit more on this mirror. It is a Delta Reflection series. I like these mirrors a lot. I think they look great and it's just overall a good quality product. The mounting bracket, I'm trying to get as many studs as possible. I'm only able to get one in the center and then I'll have two anchors off the side which will easily hold that weight. Then the mirror with the frame and a flush mount just hooks right onto that bracket and then you can center it up. So we're done and I wanna review a few things with you that really can help you with your own projects. Overall, this looks awesome. The bathroom was a complete remodel. It looks totally different, especially just even with the paint colors of this raindrop. Remember that's a Sherwin-Williams 6485 if you're interested and just the white accents. The vanity obviously looks totally different with a vessel sink, new faucet, and the mirror really helps to set it off as well. And the tub just being bright white is uh, night and day. It's also nice to have that exhaust fan in here and a better vanity light with also some solid flooring that I can maintain over time and then is very water resistant. Let's touch on budget. So you saw throughout the video, uh, things added up pretty quickly and I was way off. The original goal was $1,500 to do this myself DIY bathroom remodel. Have a few notes here that I'll reference. Um, but if we just run down the list, the exhaust fan was 179, the tub was 349, shower valve and plumbing 314, tub shower, or sorry, tub surround and caulk, 469. Miscellaneous plumbing, to get that all together, 114. Drywall, mud, and tape, 74. Vanity top, sink, and faucet, 389. Vanity light and a little bit of electrical, 209. Paint and trim, 149. Subfloor, flooring, and glue, 194. Mirror, 169. And miscellaneous, 149. So if I group those up for you, if you're looking to just do your tub surround, so if I did tub surround, you're looking at about $1,246 if you just wanna do that tub surround and redo all the plumbing and get those Delta mixing valve and the trim uh, kit in there. So that'd be $1,246. If you wanted to do just the vanity top, I'll throw the drywall in with that one. Vanity top and the vanity light with electrical together would be 672. So to get this vanity, uh, not the mirror, so to get the vanity, if I included the mirror, that would be 841. So if you did your vanity like this, you had a good base and you just did the top, you did the vessel sink, you did the faucet, uh, you did the light and the mirror, that's gonna be 841 altogether. Uh, flooring was very reasonable. For the glue down vinyl plank, I think it's great, super resilient. That was only 194. So everything together with an original budget of 1500 was almost 2X budget um, at $2,758. Again, to help you out with your own project. If you've done any projects recently in 2022, uh, you know material costs have went up a lot and that was a big miscalculation on my part. Now in terms of a time perspective, how long would this take you? If you're a DIYer doing this at nights and weekends, give yourself some time. It's gonna be multiple weeks and more likely a month long project, even if you're making significant progress, because you're gonna be facing a lot of these things for the first time and things will come up. Not everything's gonna go perfectly smooth. Lessons learned. So the second item, lessons learned that I've talked about, what would I do different? After I've already done this, um, the 400 series Delta tub surround, I like. Uh, if you do it like I show you how to do it, and remember I have those breakout videos there, it can be very, very strong. The acrylic surface is not very wear resistant. So this is a rental in Airbnb, so I'm a little concerned there. If you scrape anything sharp against that acrylic, it will gouge it and scratch it. So that's something uh, to at least consider. Uh, when you're comparing maybe a steel tub base and paying for tile. Now, obviously that is gonna be a completely different budget, but just something you have to consider. The vessel sink, although looks awesome, 
uh, has two main issues. One, it splashes out a little water, which obviously is not ideal. It's not terrible, but a few drops do splash out. And two, you saw the faucet has a little bit of an order of operations. So serviceability on this does concern me. So if at all possible, getting yourself a standard uh, vanity top and sink combo that's made for that, uh, that has better access, never good access, but at least better access, something also to consider. But overall, super happy with the project. Not too many big snags uh, in terms of what we hit along the way, but nothing that we couldn't kind of plow through and get the bathroom looking the way it is now. And then finally, how do you save money? So I have a website link down in the description. So below this video, I'm putting a page out there to help you on how to use some of the features and systems out there that professionals use at different big box stores so you can save on your projects. Now, usually that means if you can get your materials list together, and that materials list is over a certain amount, usually that's around $1,500, you can submit these to your pro desk and get a discount. Now that discount's gonna vary depending on what you're buying. For instance, paint has really high margins, uh, but lumber or some things might not. So it's gonna vary depending on what you're putting in there, but you can probably expect between 8% up to maybe an extreme of 14%. So it can be very considerable in terms of savings on your project and hopefully help you hit your budget a little bit better than I did. So check out that link down in the description. I will be building that up for you. And, and as I find more things that I think can help you save money in your DIY projects, I'll put those on that exact same website so you can reference it as a future as I'm sure things will change over time. Now, if you got some more projects around the house, check out this one right here. It's in the same property where I added an additional outlet. I did not go in the attic. I did not go in the crawl space and I was able to add that outlet without doing any drywall work, which is a couple little tricks that I'll teach you. So thanks for joining me on this video and we'll catch you on the next one. Take care.